Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. The recent joint statement by the ASEAN summit in Laos shows clearly that this regional bloc does not seek to antagonize China, their largest trade partner, or wants to be seen as too close to the United States in the maritime disputes. How do we look at the intra-ASEAN dynamics and China's proactive diplomacy with these neighboring economies in Asia? Today, I'm very happy to be joined here by Professor Wang Gengwu, Chairman of the East Asia Institute, National University of Singapore. Before we get started, let's look at this. The son of a Chinese language teacher who emigrated from Taizhou, Wang Gungwu was born in Dutch Indonesia and raised in Malaya. Wang Gungwu has taught at the University of Malaya and at the Australian National University. He was Vice-Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong from 1986 to 1995. In 2007, he became only the third person to be named University Professor by the National University of Singapore. Professor Wong has been recognized internationally as one of the world's leading historians on China and Southeast Asia. Perhaps more than anyone else, he has highlighted the complex dilemmas facing overseas Chinese living abroad and their interactions with China. Professor Wong affirms, if you don't have a sense of the past, your future will be diminished. Knowing where you come from, where your roots are, and all those great and terrible things that happened in the past strengthens your identity. Welcome to Dialogue, Professor Wang. Are there any concrete results coming out of the just concluded ASEAN summit meetings in Laos? ASEAN countries worked very hard to avoid any trouble with the powers. And they came to an agreement among themselves which suggests that the ASEAN leaders have learned to appreciate how important it is to speak with one voice. This is a very hard lesson. Uh, they've been observing lately how easy it is for ASEAN countries to be divided and they're working extremely hard to prevent that from happening. So that is their number one objective, is to, to put up a common face, a united face for the world to see. And I think for that, from that point of view, they're quite successful. And in order to do that, they had, they had to agree to certain things to, to avoid certain subjects, to avoid certain things from being mentioned, but to find other ways of expressing nevertheless their strong feelings about the need to be, uh, take peaceful methods, to avoid any kind of conflict, to avoid uh, uh, d uh, unnecessary disputes and so on. So they were also very clear about that, but they avoided the men specific mention of the July 12th uh, decision. So I think I would give credit very much to the 10 ASEAN leaders and their staff for trying to work out a way to avoid making waves in that in that meeting. Yes, of course, the spirit of uh, seeking consensus uh, does deserve credit, but won't you give credit to President Duterte, the newly elected president of the Philippines, uh, who has become a most unpredictable political force uh, in shaping the future of the South China Sea, and uh, his use of SOB for President Obama did cause a lot of uh, media coverage. Well, I don't know whether to give him credit or not, because certainly he was an unexpected development in, in the ASEAN uh, situation. I think uh, his uh, differences... Uh, the point of my question, Professor Wang, is that do you think his campaign success has successfully helped uh, defuse the crisis and diluted the tensions surrounding the South China Sea, despite the July 12th ruling from The Hague? I think there's something in that. I, I would agree that the fact that he came along and said different things from his predecessor made the situation a little easier, took, this, took the sting out of the decisions. But I think in the end, the fact is that uh, the Philippines also have been very uneasy about how far to go. They, they won their point to them. They won their point. And now what I think they really need is to restore their relations with China, which to the Philippines, I think, is, is still very, very important. They don't want to actually be entirely dependent on one side and not the other. So there are at least three goals in their, in their view. ASEAN unity is important. Good relations with China should be restored as, as, as soon as possible, if possible. And the United States not to be seen to be too close, even though deep down they are, they are very dependent on the United States, but not to be, appear too close to make it very uncomfortable for them in the, in the neighborhood. So I think they, these are three objectives, of the objectives. And I think Duterte did capture that. And by, by expressing it in the way he did, <laughs> very colorfully, uh, he has enabled, it, enabled the region to actually turn away from some of the most tricky 
issues and concentrate on what next, how best to build on the present situation and enable the relationships with China, particularly with China, to, to, to improve and still stay with one voice. That's the hardest part. And, and so I, I must say, from outside, people may not be aware how difficult that is, but I think that is a, a great achievement to, stay, to stick to be that position of, of requiring unity in the region is to me extremely positive. If that can be continued, everybody will benefit from that. President Obama canceled the meeting with his Filipino counterpart due to the unpleasant rhetoric and words by the letter. They will uh, hold an official meeting uh, later on, but what do you think of the impact upon the uh, South China Sea? Um, President Duterte has praised China for agreeing to set up a rehabilitation center for the drug users. Uh, and of course China promises to invest more in the construction of infrastructure in a country which is hungry for economic recovery. Do you think uh, uh, there is going to be growing alienation from the United States and the Philippines, uh, although cautiously, would want, want to be viewed as uh, getting closer to China, as you said wisely earlier? I, I don't know that the, uh, there is one view in the United States about the Philippines. On the one hand, there are people who take for granted that the Philippines will always be a, a younger partner to whatever the United States wants. But other people are more sensitive to, pos to the Filipinos' feelings, their nationalist feelings about uh, America, and they know that there are lots of Filipinos who resent uh, American uh, arrogance in their view. So I think there's a balance there, and the United States are not, not quite sure how to deal with Duterte yet. I think deep down they feel quite confident that the Philippines will always be close to the United States. This is a historical thing that goes back not just to the hundred years of the American relationship with the Philippines, but the deep down that the Philippines behaves like a Pacific country. It has relations with Mexico from Latin America from hundreds of years. The whole society is built on a relationship with the West, which goes back quite deep. And I think that would give them always a, 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 the, the the motive to stay close to the West. So the Americans are, are, are realizing, they realize that. So I think they can be sure that the ordinary Filipino doesn't want to break with the United States. But what they don't want is to be so obviously dependent on the United States and be seen as being just a sort of puppy dog of the United States. That's not what they want. They're, they're very proud people and quite right, they want to be seen as being masters of their own country. And Duterte expresses that. But I'm not sure that he is that hostile or that he represents any real hostility among the Filipino people against the United States and, and, and turning away from the United States. I think the relationship is a very complex and deep one. So from that point of view, the United States is probably fairly confident that the Philippines will be friendly. The question is their relations with China. Again, very deep. I mean, that has a different kind of depth. And they're also very concerned not to lose sight of that. So how to, how, to, how to restore the relations with China? I think to some extent that depends very much on China too. Uh, if China takes a very big view, a big country view, and, and shows understanding and sensitivity, I think that restoration is, is bound to come. But if there's v very specific reactions to what the Filipinos say from time to time and overdo that and being very nationalistic about it in China, that would not help. Professor Wang, uh, enough has been read about the uh, uh, concerns of uh, other ASEAN member states, particularly the Philippines. But what about Vietnam, which uh, shares uh, official ideology with uh, the Chinese Communist Party? Um, the recent visit by President Obama to Laos uh, spoke of, uh, uh, shortly dealt with the issue of uh, unexploded munitions uh, in the Vietnam. That's part of the covered operations by CIA. Uh, nevertheless, the legacy of the Vietnam continues to linger in the minds of the older generation. So what do you think of the complex concerning the bilateral relationship between Hanoi and Beijing? Uh, Hanoi, by the way, boasts of uh, a very strong conventional military. You put your finger on one of the most difficult and delicate questions in the whole relationship between China and ASEAN. Vietnam, of course, has such a deep historical relationship with China. It's very, very complex. It's uh, filled with a mixture, always been a, a mixture of admiration on the one hand and, 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 and fear on the other. And that has been such a, such a long time evolving through the centuries. That will not change. And Vietnam will always be very cautious 
of their relations with China. China, on the other hand, it fully uh, understands how Vietnamese feel about China. So I think that relationship is something that is manageable on both sides. The leaders on both sides do know. But the question remains is that Vietnam is now part of ASEAN. And Vietnam deliberately and very happily joined ASEAN in order to help it to at least lessen their dependence on China, to give them some sense of independence, which is totally understandable. So they, they would like to be able to be with ASEAN on every issue, and yet at the same time not make an enemy of China. And I think that is the delicate balance. I think China can help. China could, could, could make it easier for the Vietnamese to do that. And the way the two leaders meet from time to time between China and Vietnam, uh, to me, it's a good sign. That means both sides are very sensitive and careful about their relationship and will not want to break it. They want to keep the relationship as good as possible, as well as possible. But in the meantime, the development is quite clear. Vietnam wants to be part of ASEAN, very much so. They, they are dependent on it. And it seemed to me a good thing that Vietnam should work together with ASEAN. ASEAN can be, in a sense, a moderating force in any kind of tension between Vietnam and China. On the other hand, uh, ASEAN can help Vietnam if he Vietnam is in difficulties. This is a kind of balance which is extremely difficult to, to calculate. Today. The relationship with ASEAN aside for the moment, Professor Wang, I wonder if you have ever noticed the subtle and quiet relationship between Moscow and Hanoi, because uh, Russia keeps selling advanced weaponry, particularly uh, conventional submarines to Vietnam and also missiles to Vietnam. And Russians have forged uh, a very special strategic partnership with China. Look at the uh, recent joint naval exercises in the South China Sea. No one could question the uh, special nature of the strategic partnership between Moscow and Beijing. But how do you look at the arms sales from Russia to Hanoi what kind of impact will that deliver to China? I suspect it is partly because of a very deep understanding of the need for the multilateral relationship which will help Vietnam, just as much as they join ASEAN, to keep their ties with the, with the, with the Russians, which they had long good ties with the Russians for a long time, and at the same time to reach out even to the United States and the other, and to have good economic relations with Taiwan and, to, and with Japan and so on. So, they are actually but excuse me, Mr. Professor Wang, do you foresee that uh, Hanoi will go as far as to lease the King Ram Bay again to Russians and the Russian Navy? If they thought it would help them in this multilateral balancing, which is very complicated, if they think it will help them, I think they could. But I'm not sure that it's their first choice. I mean, if they, can, if they don't need to, they will find other ways of uh, being, being friendly with as many possible countries. Essentially, it comes from the fact that their relations with China is to them, number one. They are most concerned with that, and they're most concerned to, to be clearly independent of, the, uh, of China and, be, and be, not be afraid of China. So they, they're seeking a, a multilateral set of relationships. And ASEAN is not enough for them. So there's a, the, to keep the Russian ties, why not? And to reach out to the United States, if possible. But I think it's important to know that they are also having very good relations with Japan. And the trade relation, the economic relationship with Taiwan and Japan, and now with India, all these suggest to me uh, uh, reaching out in all directions to make themselves feel more secure. And that's not a bad thing. If Vietnam feels secure, it's not bad for China. That's good for China. Prime Minister Hun Sen was helped by the Vietnamese uh, and uh, went back to uh, um, Phnom Penh during the Cold War. However, a quarrel broke out between uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen and some of the die-hard nationalists in Vietnam about the South China Sea. Ob obviously, uh, traditionally, Hun Sen was viewed as a close ally of Hanoi because of history. However, he said, I should not be viewed as a puppet of Hanoi, and I have uh, my own independent choice uh, to serve my own national interests regarding the South China Sea. What do you think of the uh, staunch support that uh, Penang's Pan provided uh, Beijing, and that's of course very helpful in reversing the uh, very negative trend that might have taken place in uh, shaping a decision, and that will be reflected in the joint statement at the end of the ASEAN meeting that China must be held responsible, so on and so forth. Th that's predictable, but uh, Cambodia didn't do that. 
Instead, it showed its strong support, not to mention uh, the South China Sea and particularly the July 12th ruling as a chairman of uh, the ASEAN, uh, rotating chairman of the ASEAN meeting. I don't know the w how Hun Sen thinks about these matters. I'm more inclined to think of the Cambodian position in a longer historical perspective. And if you put that in perspective, you can see that for the Cambodians, their survival has always been a problem. Faced with the southward moving Vietnamese over the last few hundred years, and with tremendous pressure from the Thais on the other side for, again, hundreds of years against the Khmer Empire in the past. In the past. So the survival of Cambodia in the middle of two very powerful neighbors uh, over hundreds of years have given the Cambodians a sense of how precarious their state is. They have now for the last few decades felt the friendship of China and the way China has been interested in Cambodia's future. The way China has invested in it, the way China has made the all kinds of assurances. So I think they recognize that being closer to China actually helps them in the historical perspective against their more immediate neighbors. Now you can see how complicated all this is for ASEAN. They're all within ASEAN now. And yet internally within ASEAN, there are many physicists uh, patterns there, which are deep down in history. So all that also has to be overcome. So you can see why all these things are happening at the same time. So Cambodia cannot afford to be completely left alone in ASEAN with just the Vietnamese and the Thais on the other side without having like to have some other linkage. Now I do not know what Hun Sen is thinking, but I can, I can see this deep down in history from the days of Sihanouk in fact, going further back to the Sinhalanook's grandfather and so on, when he turned to the French. Again, they depended on the French for the survival of Cambodia. And I think all through that time, the Khmer Rouge down to Hun Sen, they all deep down also understood that their country's uh, position is not secure. And they need something else to make sure that they will not fall victim to being just either uh, having to listen to Hanoi or to Bangkok or to other powers. There's always a hard decision to be made for leaders of small countries uh, when they are wedged between major powers. You're watching dialogue with Professor Wang Gengwu, chairman of the East Asia Institute of the uh, National University of Singapore. We'll be back in a short while. Please stay with us. Welcome back, Professor Wang. Um, what do you think of the importance of a sub-regional integration and cooperation along the Mekong River? Because China is in control of the uh, water resources uh, along the upper reaches of this very important river that should be the uh, lifeline uh, for many of the economies on our periphery in Southeast Asia. Do you think this should be leveraged uh, to uh, strengthen our economic bond with uh, some of the minor economies in ASEAN? I think that's a very good question. I think this has been going on now for several decades and I think all the signs are reasonably good. I mean, people have been extremely rational about the needs of the Mekong and most of the decisions made have been very positive, trying to make something uh, of it to, so that the people who live along the rivers will actually benefit in the long run. And that provides a means of cooperation between many, many countries so within ASEAN, with China and with other other countries that are in, invested in the Mekong project. In the long run, I think that's a good sign. It, it also shows that we're not talking about strict boundaries between regions and between countries. That's not a good way of approaching it, even though that is reality. That everything that can help to cross boundaries and bring about exchanges of both information and understanding between countries across boundaries is a very good thing. The Mekong project is an example of how that can work. I think it has, it has a good record. It's not a great success, but it has enabled so many countries to keep talking to each other about mutual benefits. I think in the long run, this is a good thing, to keep the channels open, to keep people co collaborating on humane, pro humanitarian, environmental projects, which actually benefit people, and, and the world can see that it is actually benefiting people, people around it. But of course, that's not yet certain. One emerging dynamic country in ASEAN is uh, Myanmar. 
What do you think of, first of all, the dynamics of democratization in this country in its relationship with the leadership of Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, whose uh, enormous efforts to maintain the proper ties with the military, and those who supported her to return uh, to this power center stage? So. Uh, on the other hand, there is the imminent issue of national reconciliation. Uh, without the help of China, that will be very difficult to facilitate this process. First of all, um, do you think the uh, uh, process of democratization is very successful, or do you think that has been seriously compromised by the power arrangements subtly between the military and the civilian? I think it is fascinating to see how the leaders in Myanmar came to a compromise to, to reach what they've got today. It suggests to me that people are rational, and people are looking at the national interests of Burma. And for them to have divided all these years have been tremend done tremendous damage to both the economy and to the people's livelihood. And they are aw they've awoken to that. That cannot go on. So they've come to this compromise. I think that's a very patriotic thing for both sides to, to have come to that agreement. So I think that's a very positive sign. It means that people are just not hardened in their views, but recognize that in the long run, the, for the good of the country, they have to live with a system which is not perfect either way. Not, ha not entirely happy for the military, not entirely happy for the democratic forces of the country. But I, I think Myanmar is a very special case because unlike the rest of Southeast Asia, it is the only one that actually has a choice, not just between the uh, United States and uh, China, which most people con concentrate on, but they have actually tremendous capacity to negotiate between India and China. And they are now building on that one, both India and China have shown their interest in the future of uh, Myanmar's development. And the, and the Myanmar people recognize that. And their position is really quite secure in that way. If they can keep a, a good relations with both those countries, they are, are going to like to, to benefit the most. They don't have to depend on the United States. In fact, I don't think they do. Uh, right now, they're again using like Vietnam, multilateral relationships, they're very good relations with Japan for economic reasons. United States doesn't have that much to invest in it, but for Japan, yes. And India, for security and other relations, very good relations now are building up with India. And I think that, that way ca they can assure both the Democrats and the military that they have a better chance of survival for the country and to restore its capacity to improve the economy, which it desperately needs. And in fact, they are really struggling now to try and readjust the whole country to a more open economy. What do you think of the uh, charisma and leadership of Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, laureate of Nobel Peace Prize, who was given a uh, red carpet ceremony, a very warm welcome here in China twice. For in, the first, uh, in the first case, she was treated uh, very nicely, though she was opposition. Now, after she became uh, the, the, the de facto leader in Myanmar, she was also warmly received by President Xi Jinping in China. But ironically, she has not been able to solve the issue of the Mitsong Dam, which came to a halt. Well, I think this, you're right to point to her charisma. She is really quite remarkable to have achieved what she has done, given all the problems that she had to face for the last two decades. I mean, she had very little chance to do anything for a long time. But the fact that she's able to achieve what she has achieved today, and the fact that she's now on the world stage uh, as a foreign minister to, to virtually act on behalf of the country almost ev you know, in everything, is, is totally remarkable. And I think her strength actually is in her symbolic importance to the, for, the country, for dealing with outside countries. Internally, I don't know that she's actually capable of doing too much, because first of all, she has no real power to, to run the country. She has no experience in doing that. But her image, international image, is a tremendous help to, to Myanmar. And but all the countries are responding to that. They are treating her the way you described, very royally, and that is very wise. But my concern would be that in, within the country, how she can bridge the gap between her kind of leadership and the, and the needs of the country, which are really still basically in the hands of the military and their, their colleagues and their team. That is the hardest part. Of that, I, I have no clear idea how she would solve that problem. Right now, I'm very impressed by the fact that they've got to the point where they're trying to have a reconciliation with all the border areas and the, the, the conflicts which uh, have really been such a done such, so much damage to the unity of the country. Uh, if she can find a solution to that one, I think she really will be the national hero of that country. 
how do you assess the Chinese influence in the process of uh, national reconciliation? And in fact, uh, one of the major issues on her agenda with the President Xi Jinping during the official visit to Beijing was to seek help from Beijing to help involve those pro allegedly pro China ethnic groups, the uh, local militias that were on loggerheads or have been on loggerheads with the uh, government of Myanmar. I think China has been extremely wise in handling it the way uh, Xi Jinping, your, 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 prime, your president, has handled it very well to assure the, the Myanmar government that the Chinese will not do anything or encourage anything that will create disunity in the country and have encouraged the people who, are, who look to China to be closer to the government. I think in the long run, this is in the interest of both countries. And I think uh, Aung San Suu Kyi appreciates that that China has made a contribution. The thing is that sometimes people blame China for creating the problems and that's been very, very unfair. Most of these people did look to China and expect China to do things to, for, for them. And China ability to resist getting too closely involved in the politics of Myanmar more recently has been a very positive sign. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your insightful comments on South China Sea issues. Thank you very much. It's good to see you again. Thank you very much. Sir.